Good afternoon. It's another great day in Washington State for many reasons, one of which is we have great news on our vaccine effort. We currently have about 3 million Washingtonians who are currently eligible for the vaccine. And today we're going to announce we're going to have another 2 million eligible for the vaccine fairly shortly. And I'm excited to share this great news. Before I do that, though, I, I want to to acknowledge a, a problem that we have in our society and in our state, and that is the increasing violence against our Asian American uh, folks, which is extremely disturbing. Uh, we've had reported events in our state that have involved horrific acts of violence. In February, an Inglemore teacher, a woman of Japanese ancestry, uh, was attacked in Seattle's International District, one of quite a number of disturbing incidents. And we know that for every one of those who are reported, uh, folks who are Asian American have suffered unreported incidents as well. We need to recognize this is a scourge. It is not just in other states, unfortunately, it is in our state as well. And we all have to wrap our arms in the embrace of our neighbors and community members who are Asian American to stand against this. Uh, I will be talking to some uh, leaders in the community, I believe next Monday, about potential approaches. But we don't have to wait for formal government action. All of us have some role to speak against this uh, totally unacceptable uh, violence against our folks. And I hope all of us will do so. So, talking about our COVID response. Uh, as the uh, economic toll of COVID continues to burden many Washingtonians, including tenants, obviously. I am extending the state's eviction moratorium uh, through June 30th. Uh, using state and federal funds, as you know, $504 million has already been set aside for assistance, and hundreds of millions of dollars more of rental assistance uh, is on its way through Congress's America's Rescue Plan. Now, it's important to note these funds help both tenants and landlords uh, through these difficult economic times. And I've said each time that we've extended this moratorium, if you can pay rent, pay it. That's the right thing to do. Uh, we are acting in good faith for a lot of people, and we know who they would be in some very dire situations uh, without this moratorium. I'm also signing an extension of the utility shutoff moratorium today, which we extended through July 31st. And yesterday, I uh, updated our consumer debt garnishment proclamation to protect any federal payments someone receives in response to the pandemic from garnishment, uh, not just those that are labeled stimulus payments. People need these supports right now. There's no other way to look at it. I'm glad we were able to take these measures. Now, while uh, we're making this progress, I have to tell you that there's reason to be impressed with our continued effort on the vaccine front. We know that this is central to our long-term economic recovery in the, in the state of Washington. So we've got some really good news today. Uh, on Wednesday, about 600,000 more Washingtonians became eligible for the COVID vaccine. And I encourage everyone who is eligible to get this vaccine. It works, it's safe. it's safe, it's fairly convenient, and it can save your life and your loved ones. And no matter when you became eligible throughout this progress, you will remain eligible. So if you're over 65 and you're eligible today, we have more people who are becoming eligible, but you still are eligible to get the vaccine. That'll remain the case throughout this vaccine recovery program. Now, because our doses are increasing and because we are now meeting our vaccination goals of vaccinating people, we can announce two new tiers, or the, excuse me, the next two tiers of those eligible for the vaccine. Uh, they, they will become eligible on March 31st, less than two weeks from now. These tiers will open up the vaccine to nearly 2 million more Washingtonians in addition to the 3 million who are eligible as of today. 
So here's what these, uh, the next tier will be. This will be open uh, uh, on that date to anyone over the age of 16 who has two or more comorbidities. And those are defined uh, by the Department of Health. Also, anyone who is between the ages of 60 and 65. Also, anyone living in congregate settings, such as correctional facilities, group homes, or those with disabilities. Also, those experiencing homelessness who live in or access services to congregate settings. Also, any additional workers in these, those types of congregate settings. And also, it includes restaurants and food service workers, manufacturing workers, and construction workers. They will all be available and eligible for the vaccine beginning on March 31st. Now, reaching more of our workers who, who uh, work in congregate settings is very important to our state's effort. It's very important to reduce the transmission rate of the disease, which helps everyone. And it's very important to maintain equity, which is so important in our efforts in this vaccine a rollout effort. Yesterday, I visited a mass vaccination site at the Toyota Center in Wenatchee. And I also went to a wellness clinic at uh, Chelan uh, Fruit in Chelan. And I was very pleased about how smoothly both of these operations went. The Wenatchee Max va vaccination site also does something that's really important from our equity perspective, because we want people to be able to get this vaccine even if you're not using a computer regularly. So it offers appointment scheduling by phone in multiple languages. So you don't need the internet, you just need access to the phone. And we've got people standing by uh, for multiple languages to help get that appointment. This is designed to improve equity and I'm really glad this is happening. And it's not just in the Wenatchee site, other sites are doing this as well. I'm also happy about the general pace of this timeline. This timeline is much faster than we would have predicted a couple months ago. And it's thanks uh, to the tremendous work of the Biden administration of dramatically increasing the production of these vaccines. They have done this in multiple ways, one of which is the use of the Defense Production Act. And I'm grateful to have a president who is committed enough to the health of Washingtonians to use that act, something I've been advocating for over a year. Uh, I also want to thank the Department of Health and our partners in our local regional health efforts as well. Uh, I saw local regional health officials doing tremendous work in uh, Schlein Douglas, Okanagan County yesterday. So I hope you will continue to go to the Department of Health website, doh.wa.gov, and click on the Phase Finder tool to determine when you are uh, eligible, if you're eligible right now, and find a location to become vaccinated. Now, obviously, we still want more doses. We can take all the doses we can get, in effect. But, and we're going to continue to adopt our strategy as time goes on. But we should be very pleased right now. Uh, I want to talk about another reason we've had a success in this, and that is our public-private partnerships. Our success in getting more than 2.5 million doses administered to date is thanks to the efforts of many dedicated providers and public health professionals, including the National Guard, which is so effective uh, in Wenatchee yesterday. We continue to share a big debt of gratitude with our uh, public-private partnership at the Vaccine Action Command and Coordination Center as well. Uh, I don't think any other state has, such a, uh, has undertaken such a scale of public-private partnership in their vaccine response. And I'm glad Washington State is again being innovative in this regard. Uh, our partners include many, including Microsoft, Starbucks, Amazon, Expedia, Costco, Kaiser Permanente, Providence, the Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation, and so many hundreds of volunteers who've been volunteering the, their time. We have volunteer vaccinators who are using their days off, who are working as nurses and otherwise. We have volunteers doing logistical work. We have firefighters. It's just been an amazing effort. So we want to thank uh, those folks. Now, one of the successes we've had is that we started yesterday, rolled out the Department of Health's a new vaccine locator tool 
that we think can be of substantial assistance to people finding appointments. It's as easy as going to vaccinator, excuse me, vaccine locator .doh.wa.gov, vaccine locator .doh.wa.gov. And uh, it's easy as typing in your zip code and the app will show you uh, your approximate providers, ones that are close to you. It'll also tell you how current the information is. So it'll tell you if they just got information 30 minutes ago that that particular pharmacy has vaccines to let you know how, how fresh that information is. And we, we think this is gonna be substantial help to folks. So many thanks to Microsoft, Starbucks, Expedia, Costco, Proto Ventures, and many others in helping develop this app. We think it is one of the leading approaches of the states on how to ease people's access to find these appointment, appointments. It's good to be uh, leading the class, so to speak. Uh, we're also improving customer support with the state hotline for scheduling appointments. And starting next week, Amazon call center representatives will be joining hotline workers to schedule appointments. And our friends at the nonprofit Challenge Seattle Group are also stepping up to help any entity have the tools to organize their max vaccination site. We anticipate there will be more in the next several months. So that group is releasing a playbook for mass vaccination sites we think can be helpful to folks. Now this will be a free resource about how to handle logistics, operations, and communications. Uh, I've been astounded at how fast these have been set up and how efficient they are, but we wanna help other people uh, get these things stood up. I'd also like to call out the good work of UFCW 21, which has organized vaccination opportunities and outreach to its grocery workers who are now eligible. Thanks to those efforts, we are really hopeful that our frontline grocery worker, workers will be vaccinated as soon as possible. Great that they are uh, uh, they're eligible. So today to talk more about the Vaccine Action Command and Coordination System, we have Dan Laster, who is doing great work for the state of Washington. Dan, thanks for jumping into the breach here. Thank you, Governor. So uh, I, I first just want to start by thanking all of our frontline workers who every day are working to keep Washingtonians safe. And I, I just really want to echo the governor's comments about the extraordinary partnering among the public sector, the private sector, unions, volunteers. It's, it's, it's absolutely extraordinary. Uh, but I'd re be remiss if I didn't also recognize the absolutely extraordinary work and the long days and weekends that are being put in by our Department of Health employees and serving Washingtonians. They literally are working late through the day and into the night. The amount of work that's been accomplished in less than two months when we stood up the center is by such a large group of people and organizations, it's simply incredible. And although, as the governor pointed out, we were really pleased at some of the successes we are delivering uh, literally last night with the, uh, the vaccine locator tool, and we'll be expanding the call center capacity, there is a lot of work to do. We, we know that. And um, our approach is to move as quickly as we can and move iteratively. So we hope that we can continue at this pace because we wanna get everyone vaccinated as quickly as possible. And we welcome the public's feedback on the work we're doing, because ultimately, if we're not serving you, we're, we're, we're not doing our job. Uh, I just wanna give you a couple of examples as we're moving forward. First, we are gonna make further improvements to the vaccine locator tool. And in fact, one of the key areas is the more we can get the federal pharmacies to provide electronic connectivity so that we can provide Washingtonians real, true real-time ability to make appointments, that will lead to our success. And again, we'll just make it even that much easier and for Washingtonians to truly have even more confidence that the appointments are there at the moment they're looking. Second, we're gonna continue the great work that is underway, improving the efficiency and the patient experience of Washingtonians in getting vaccinated. 
There's a lot of great work that's already been done across the various vaccination sites across the state, but we're gonna continue that work as we scale up. And then finally, I just wanna say that we are increasing our focus on supporting the Department of Health as vaccine supply increases, which of course we are delighted to see happening. And as the Department of Health works across the vaccine ecosystem in the state of Washington to ensure that we can scale up to vaccinate all Washingtonians in the safest, in the fastest, most equitable and efficient way possible. I'd just like to end by saying truly how proud I am of everyone partnering and coming together for a common goal. And I have to say in this effort, we are viewed as a leader across the United States. Thanks, Governor. Uh, thank you, Dan. Your leadership has been tremendous and we really, really appreciate it. It's made a huge difference in our efforts and uh, you've just moved so quickly. We really appreciate that. We also have some good news today about our uh, family members and friends who are in long-term care facilities and our ability to visit them, something that's so important both to them and us. Uh, the pandemic has, of course, made these visits a challenge to do this in a safe way. Uh, but because of our progress, we are now uh, in a position to allow more visitations in more situations. So I'm announcing today that outdoor uh, visitation will still be preferred for folks. But in any situation where either the resident of a long-term care facility or their guests are vaccinated, uh, our folks will now be able to have indoor visitation. So if your uh, mother is in a facility and she is vaccinated uh, and you are not, you still will be able to visit with her indoors. If you are vaccinated and she is not, you will be able to visit her in indoors. And the reason for this is we believe there's substantial confidence that these vaccines reduce the transmission rates of individuals besides saving their lives. So we're very excited about this because we know this has been so difficult for our folks in these long-term care facilities to be isolated as it is for us. And we believe the progress we have made has allowed us to do this. Again, being able to do this is because Washingtonians are wearing masks, because they're complying with social distancing. We are knocking down these numbers, and this has allowed us, with combination of the arrival of the vaccine, to have these long-awaited loving re reunions in a physical way, in an indoor way, uh, with our loved ones. Now, if neither folks are vaccinated, we'll need to continue those visitations to be as they are right now, which are uh, largely are in an outdoor setting. Uh, there are compassionate situations uh, where there is exceptions to this rule in, ex in extreme circumstances. Also, residents who are vaccinated uh, no longer uh, uh, will no longer have to quarantine on admission or after a higher risk community visit, unless there has been a known exposure to a confirmed COVID case. Indoor visits uh, also would not be allowed, of course, during active outbreaks or for residents with confirmed COVID-19 or for residents who are in quarantine for COVID-19. Obviously, we also require facilities to adhere to core infection prevention principles that have been placed during the pandemic. And we know people have been working hard on those. Um, symptom screening for everyone entering, basic hygiene, appropriate PPE, testing of staff and residents, of course, will need to continue. So we're really happy about making this progress. We wanna thank everybody who's made this possible. Before I stand for your questions, I'm gonna to need to take about a three minute break. If you can excuse me, we shall return. Okay, you may fire when ready, Gridley. All right. Up first, we'll go to Rachel LaCourt with AP. Go ahead, Rachel. Hi, Governor. I have a three-part question. Um, <laughs> given that we're seeing people hang out at vaccination sites or pharmacies in hopes of getting extra doses at the end of the day, why not just open it up to everyone at this point with the understanding that the supply may not immediately meet the demand? And with the CDC's allowance of smoking as a comorbidity, does the state plan to quantify what level of smoking would need to be shown in order to be considered one of the two comor comorbidities? 
And lastly, based on this expedited, expedited timeline, do you anticipate the general population will be eligible before May 1st? Well, uh, uh, I'll take them in reverse order on the eligibility. Um, we have received a directive from the federal government that all people will be available on May 1st. So we would anticipate that will be the situation. And we're moving as fast as we can to get everybody in the priority uh, groups uh, vaccinated because of that. On the smoking issue, we have on the line, um, Michelle, could you answer that question, Michelle? I don't think that we're doing anything to change the definition of smoking uh, as a priority, but could you have any more clarity on that? Um, yeah, we do not plan, Governor um, and Rachel, on doing any further definition of um, defining smoking. So we are using the CDC um, chronic medical condition list about people um, and conditions that put people at either known higher risk or maybe at higher risk. As far as the prioritization, the reason we have prioritization is to save as many lives as possible and to deal with, uh, to help people whose jobs have necessitated them being exposed in congregate settings. And so we want to save as many lives as possible. And the reason and the way to do that, obviously, is to vaccinate the people who are most subject to this disease. These have been folks of uh, age and now comorbidities. We obviously did our health workers and we're doing now our essential workers, including uh, grocery store workers and agriculture workers and teachers and emergency folks and child care workers. So we're trying to have a, a rational approach in a very difficult circumstance. And that difficult circumstance is we have 7 million Washingtonians, uh, probably who 5.5 million of them you know, could be eligible due to age, and we're not getting anywhere near that on a daily basis. So. I think this is the only rational approach is to make very hard prioritization decisions based on how we can save the most Washingtonians lives. Now that approach has been effective so far. As you know, we have one of the lower mortality rates in the United States. And this science based approach demonstrably has saved hundreds of thousands of people considering all of our COVID response relative to other states. So I do think that it is well based and factually supported to continue on this, on this process. And I'm very pleased we're now moving through these tranches at the pace we are. Again, I wanna reiterate, this is much faster than we thought we were being able to get this life-saving drug first to those who need it most. All right, up next, we'll go to Joe Sullivan with the Seattle Times. Go ahead, Joe. Governor, what sort of an assessment do you have so far if, if 30% of the state doesn't end up ultimately uh, getting the vaccine. What does that mean for us? Well, uh, first off, we're not locked into that. We may exceed that. We don't know the answer to that yet. But all I can tell you is every time a Washingtonian gets the vaccine, two really great things happen. Number one, their, their odds of, of going down uh, go down so dramatically to getting COVID. These are 95% effective to prevent hospitalization and death. So that means if Mr. Smith gets a vaccine, his life with a high degree of probability will be saved if he were otherwise gonna be transmitted with the virus. But second, it helps the whole community advance towards herd immunity so we can open up fully our businesses. So we can go back to all the games we wanna to go to with as many people as we wanna to go to. So the whole community, so it's a community-minded response as well. We don't know where that magic number is, but every time somebody gets this vaccine, we get closer to it. Now, what I think we are going to experience, and I think are already experiencing, is that some people, you know, they wanna see the performance of the vaccine. Uh, and I think as they see their friends and relatives getting the vaccine and, and not getting COVID and not having adverse effects, more and more people, a higher and higher percentage of people will be confident to get the vaccine. Um, you know, uh, Governor Justice of West Virginia, he had a comment the other day along the similar lines. He says, you know, I think a lot more people are gonna get the vaccine when they see their pals getting it and they don't grow antlers. 
I thought that was sort of a West Virginia way to say it, uh, but I don't fully incorporate. But the point is, I think confidence will build over time. We're already starting to see that. And I encouraged all of us to encourage our loved ones, uh, our friends. I encourage the employer community to share this information with their employees. This is really important for their businesses and our larger community. Uh, yesterday, when we were at the Chelan Fruit, uh, we had uh, a tremendous local health plan and an employer who cared about their employees and opened up their business, uh, uh, which was right on uh, Fruit Line, one of the largest uh, fruit lines in the state. By the way, here's a good story. The last time I was at that uh, warehouse, it had burnt down. I was standing in the smoldering ruins. And yesterday, I saw the very first uh, local employer agricultural-based vaccination site. It was kind of a, a happy transition for us to see that progress. All right, up next, we'll go to Sarah Gensler with McClatchy. Go ahead, Sarah. May I add one more thing, if I may? Uh, our sense is, looking at the science, the thought that there's some sort of bright line between herd immunity and not herd immunity may not be the way to look at this. It's probably more of a gradient to some degree uh, where you decrease the rates of transmission as you increase vaccinations. We think we probably are seeing some of that already. So we think we're seeing reduction of some hospitalizations and certainly deaths as a result of the, the vaccination itself, even before we get to 70%. Up next, we'll go to Sarah Gensler with McClatchy. Go ahead, Sarah. Maybe be best answered by Michelle. My question is um, whether the state can or is tracking any sort of vaccine waste, if there are any doses that are being disposed of um, at the end of the day. Yeah, we are tracking vaccine waste. So you could email the DOH PIO box um, and get the exact numbers. Um, luckily, our waste has been incredibly low and um, not a substantial problem. We also have been supporting PROM, all of the healthcare providers who are administering COVID vaccine and having plans for the exact situation you're talking about, about how to best use vaccine doses at the end of the day. Once a vial has been opened, there is a time limit for when it needs to be used. And so we are encouraging healthcare providers and providing support to kind of have an end of the day wait list and working with community partners and others to have a list of people who are eligible for vaccine in the current phases that they could call in at the end of the day. We also let providers know that we never want any dose of vaccine going to waste. So if you can't find somebody in the time limit of when before a vaccine would need to be wasted, um, we encourage them to just make sure they can use that vaccine for anybody to make sure that dose gets into arms. I don't know what the number is, but I do know it's an infinitesimal percentage and if you do report it, reporting that percentage, I think most people would agree. We've had tremendous success in preventing wastage. And I want to thank everybody who's been so flexible and ready to hop to it to get to get this vaccination in arms. And, and people have done amazing things. They've called through, you know, uh, uh, lists of folks who needed treatment. They've done a great job making sure we don't have any meaningful wastage. All right. Up next, we'll go to Austin Jenkins with Northwest News Network. Go ahead, Austin. Thank you. Um, Governor, I wanted to go back to the question Rachel asked just about whether you might be able to expand eligibility to everybody before May 1st. I'm noticing before that. Before uh, May 1st. I'm sorry. I'm, I may have misunderstood her question. I'm sorry. No, that's fine. I'm just noticing that, like, in Ohio, the Governor uh, DeWine has, has said March 29th he'll be able to do that. Um, Connecticut and Michigan have, have targeted April 5th. Utah. I think April 1st. So just for those waiting to find out what, what's your thinking about the, the weeks ahead and that May 1st deadline and whether you can beat it. Well, I doubt that we would advance that eligibility, you know, into early April. I very much doubt that because we do need to get these folks who are most at risk today, which are the folks with comorbidities and the like, including some of our essential workers, which include teachers and grocery store workers and agriculture workers. We need these people to be able to get their vaccine. Now, in answering this question, it's kind of a trick question because governors look great when they just say everybody's eligible for the vaccine. 
But it's one thing to be eligible for that vaccine, and it's another to actually be able to get it. So just because the governor says, I've opened this available to everybody, it doesn't mean he's, he or she has delivered it to people. So I'm, I'm not as impressed by that as maybe some uh, uh, public relations people would want to be. We want people to get vaccines, not just be eligible for them. So I think it's unlikely it would be substantially before that. But if our vaccination rate increases dramatically, it could move up from May 1st. That is a, that's a possibility. And the more people get into get these vaccines, the faster we'll get there to get to that uh, level. I do want to tell you how important this is too. Look, we got people who have, you know, um, who've had double lung transplants, who have cancer, have immunosuppression, who have any number of these morbidities that does put them at a significantly greater risk. And I just have to believe that most Washingtonians believe that those people ought to be you know, the next in line, so to speak, to get this life-saving drug. And if you, quote, open it up to everybody, that means somebody who's had a double lung transplant doesn't get it. And this is a hard thing for people to, sometimes, frankly, to understand. I've had this conversation many, many times when folks have said, gee, I'd like to move, I'd like to have my vaccine today. And I said, well, that means you're going to have a 75-year-old who doesn't get it then if you take it. And they go, no, 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 I don't mean that. I don't want to take it away from anybody else. I just want mine today. Well, we need to look at this with an ounce of compassion and heartfelt love for those who are most at risk. And that's what we're doing in the state of Washington. All right, up next, we'll go to Jerry Cornfield with the Everett Herald. Go ahead, Jerry. I should also- Governor, go Governor, I'm first just, on the vaccine, and it might be for Michelle, I'm getting a little confused with the numbers. We have, what, about 7.4 million residents in Washington, and then uh, a portion are not eligible because they're kids. They're too young, and 5 million are going to become eligible on March 31st. I, what is left? How many people after March 31st are still out there? Um, and then that's part one. And then part two, switching topics to the federal aid I wondered if you are ready to um, identify some priorities, big ticket priorities of how you'd like to spend the money in particular. I'd be interested in knowing if you want to invest big on replacing culverts, extending broadband to communities that need it during the pandemic and plugging the uh, red ink in the uh, transportation budget that's been due to the loss of revenues from the pandemic. Go ahead, Michelle. Yeah, the good news is, we, as you pointed out, we are moving through eligible Washingtonians pretty quickly. We estimate that the total population who is 16 older and older in our state is about 16.2 million people. So there will be around another um, million people who will be eligible after March, um, after we get through the group that we're bringing in on March 31st. Yeah, I'm going to defer answering your question to some subsequent discussions, Jerry, to give you a, a more refined uh, answer as what our priorities. I don't think it'd be really productive just give you general comments right now, but we will have this discussion. Trust us. By the way, I want to do that uh, one thing that was the previous question about this issue of these tiers. There, there are two issues about this. One is to prioritize those whose lives are really in jeopardy. But the second is to, you know, reduce frustration of people. If I had gone out day one and said, everybody, you just go fight for the vaccine, and we had 7 million people fighting for vaccine on the first day, it would have been a, you know, very frustrating to people with no efficiency whatsoever. So that is an additional reason that we think these tiers make sense to save lives and have a rational uh, distribution system. Up next, we'll go to Essex Porter with Cairo 7. Go ahead, Essex. Yes, Governor, it, it does seem that the pace is quickening. How will you know it will be time for a full reopening of businesses and other institutions in Washington? Essex, uh, this is a question we've been discussing for a year now, and I always give the most accurate comprehensive answer I can, and it remains the same. 
we will be looking at the incoming science uh, involving COVID, looking intensely every single day at all of the scientific information to indicate it to us whether it's relatively safe to open up these operations. And as you know, we have very extensive science about that subject. I am briefed by the Institute for Disease Modeling every week, and I talk to our Department of Health every day. And every day I look at the reports showing all of these metrics from the hospitalization rates to the positivity rate uh, to the daily rate. And we look at this both on an actual and a logarithmic scale, and we evaluate the trend of the disease. We then look at all of the international science that comes in on a daily basis about the efficacy of the vaccines against uh, death, hospitalizations, and transmission. And that information has been critical to us recently. It's one of the reasons we were able to open up visitation today because the new science indicate these vaccines are effective against transmission. Uh, we're looking at all of that scientific information, both on what the statistics are in our state and what they are internationally and nationally. Because obviously those national and international trends affect us ultimately as well. And we make a judgment on a daily basis, what is the risk factors of any particular decision on opening or reopening? We are extremely gratified. We've been able to reopen up significantly in many, many of our industries in the last couple of weeks, as you know. And that's been based on our declining uh, uh, metrics of, every, of virtually all of these scientific issues and the new information about the efficacy of the vaccines. We obviously then look at the operational uh, impact on these industries. We try to understand these industries. And we try to understand what they really need uh, and what would be most useful to them. And we, we work with them on protocols that can make them as safe as possible. We think about the ramifications on our schools. And I'm very pleased that we now have more children having an on-site option. I'm thrilled to see progress in that regard in the last few days. And uh, we think about that impact as well. So those are all things we think about. There's no one single metric that I can give you. Uh, all of those things play a role in our judgment. But I can say that we'd like to see this progress continue. And I wanna thank Washingtonians who have made this progress possible. The reason we are able to do this reopening is a combination of people wearing masks uh, and social distancing when they can and continuing to do so. I think this is a most important uh, moment. I think President Biden, can't remember exact, his exact language, but he said this is a moment of optimism and opportunity, but it is not a moment for a lack of determination, determination and diligence. These masks still are imperative to wear when we're in public, imperative. I can't overstate that. And the reason is, is because these variants are signi apparently significantly more transmittable. And I read an article yesterday that suggested that the, the 17 is maybe 60% more potentially fatal. So the masks remain incredibly important in the upcoming months. And I wanna thank Washingtonians who are wearing them big time. Because we are doing this, we are saving over 200,000 lives in the state of Washington in the last year. And that's a heck of a good performance level. And I want to thank Washingtonians for being heroes. All right, up next, we'll go to Hannah Scott with Cairo Radio. Go ahead, Hannah. Hi, Governor. I want to just switch gears and see if you've had a chance over the last few weeks to really take a look at the Blake decision out of the state Supreme Court regarding the drug possession law that was tossed out and the ripple effects it's having to our justice system. I'm wondering, given our better than expected economic forecast, if you would back the idea of using some of this money in the budgets to really significantly invest in behavioral health and treatment. Well, definitely we want to see increased investments in behavioral and treatment, uh, treatment, mental health treatment. Uh, it wasn't my budget. I'll continue to support this. We're in better financial position, obviously, than we were when I had to roll out my budget. You bet we want to see increased investments. Now, this is something when I started, you know, a year ago in our, in our uh, last speech, I made an emphasis on mental health. It's one of the reasons we want to reform our mental health system to go to a more community-based system. 
And this has doubled the incentive for us to get that kind of uh, job done. That includes chemical addiction assistance for people. So you bet, I hope that, that we will make some significant strides in this realm. Now, there are many permutations of the Blake decision which we are not, we haven't been able to fully evaluate, including all kinds of operational issues on, our, on a variety of state operations we're still studying. Up next, we'll go to Casey Decker with CREM News. Go ahead, Casey. In recent weeks, uh, there's been some pretty significant pressure from the hospitality industry, the restaurant industry, to have restaurant workers become eligible for the vaccine. And so I was wondering uh, to what extent, if any, that sort of lobbying played a role in the decision to include them in this accelerated timeline. Well, we always appreciate people making their views known. But I can't say that the, that, that has that had a big impact because we were already aware of the huge desire for food service workers to get this. We understand they've been working now for over a year without a vaccine. We also understand that, that they, they do serve now indoor people who aren't wearing masks because they can't when they're eating. So we were well aware of all those things. It, it didn't really take a large lobbying effort to get us to be aware of that. The situation was, however, again, we have a limitation of vaccine. We've had to make some very difficult choices. Early in the process, we've decided to save lives by giving the vaccine to the people who are most in danger. And with some of the workers, we decided that the food service workers and grocery workers, to some degree, were more essential in a sense because we get our basic foodstuffs from grocery stores. This is not to diminish the importance of restaurants, but we made that decision, I, and I think that's a justifiable decision. Uh, had we didn't done them at the same time, it would have made about a two-week difference. So uh, I'm really glad we're moving forward on this, and I'm glad that these hardworking people, uh, I used to be a server at Clicker Dagger, Bickerstaff, and Public, Pets Public House, and I respect how hard these jobs are that they've been doing, and I appreciate what they've been doing. Nick, did you have something you wanted to add? Yeah, I just wanted to build on the governor's remarks a bit and mention that one of the primary reasons we've placed restaurant workers into this this tier of vaccination is due to the the high infection rates in the restaurant and food service sector. They are um, uh, on the top, uh, the, the number one outbreak setting in Washington in non healthcare settings. And so uh, elevating those workers for prioritization for vaccine is is one way to help with those high infection rates. And I'm really happy we're doing this earlier than we originally anticipated a couple months ago. This is great news for, for restaurant workers, in my view. All right, up next, we'll go to Keith Eldridge with Como4. Go ahead, Keith. I go to uh, phase three starts Monday. We have phase four yet and an end game so people can stay energized and keep their masks on. I'm not sure I heard your whole question. I think you're asking about phase four. We've not announced or made decisions about uh, particular decisions. We just got into this phase. We don't have any further guidance uh, available at the moment. You said something about masks, and I wasn't sure what it was. What, what did you ask about masks? Just the idea that if you had an end game in sight, that uh, people would be more willing to keep their masks on and keep the fight going instead of having pandemic fatigue. Yeah, I'm not sure I got the whole question, but I think you asked, did it make sense to do a phase four now to help people have masks? People are wearing masks now. No, I don't think it's necessary because people know in Washington state that this makes a huge difference. And as a result, we've saved hundreds of thousands of lives and we will continue to do that even with the vaccine arrival. So I don't believe that that's necessary. We'll make a decision when we can based on the science on, on the next phase. All right, up next, we'll go to Brandy Cruz with Q13. Go ahead, Brandy. Hi, Governor. Uh, you mentioned long-term care facilities. Um, you know, we know that nationally there's been heightened scrutiny over how states handled nursing homes in the early stages of the pandemic. Uh, here in Washington, you incentivize nursing homes to take patients from hospitals to create capacity. Should the state have allowed, let alone incentivized, those transfers given the risk of death to that population? I don't see a reason to second guess that decision. We had a looming critical uh, shortage of space in our hospital, so I would not second guess that decision based on the rear view mirror. All right, 
Up next, we'll go to David Kremen with Crosscut. Go ahead, David. Yeah, hi, Governor. Um, following up on the question about the Blake decision, there's one bill in the legislature that would restore the law criminalizing felony drug possession with just the word knowingly added. I'm curious if that's an approach you support or if you'd like to see the state take a different approach that de-emphasizes criminalization as some have, have called for. Well, I'm not prepared to uh, rule out proposals on how to deal with this. There's so many complexities with this decision that I've, I need to work with legislators to come up with something to, to see if they can. I don't know if they can or not reach consensus, but I need to have a lot more conversation with legislators to see what might be the right approach. All right, and our last question will come from Mayor Kawash with KXLY. Go ahead, Mayor. Hi, Governor. We're expecting the CDC to announce tomorrow that physical distancing in schools will go from six feet to three feet. Uh, wondering if you plan to adopt that, and if so, how soon? Well, I've not been uh, shared that information, so I can't comment on it. I'll have to wait to see what they see or what they say. At the moment, we have not made a decision to change. We're working to get our schools reopened, and we're making good progress on that. I want to keep that progress going. Uh, I wouldn't want to do anything that would slow down that progress, but obviously we'll look at science, you know, in the future as it continues to come in. But we're not making any changes, certainly today. Dr. Shaw, did you have something to add? Yeah, Governor. Uh, so I just wanted to add that um, uh, we're we're watching and we have conversations almost on a daily basis with our federal partners, including the CDC, about changing guidance and things that they're thinking about. And uh, the timeline I did not hear about tomorrow, so we'll continue to watch that. But I think the governor and I have been very clear that we continue to follow the, the science and the evidence. And we want to make sure that what we're, we're doing is uh, erring on the side of health and safety and protection. And so that's the key message. And so we're obviously going to look at uh, if it is tomorrow or whenever it is, uh, we're going to look at what they release and what they say and what most importantly is what's the reason that they have put that out there. And most of the time we agree with it. Sometimes we may have a disagreement with it, but regardless, we're going to look at it. And certainly as things evolve, we will certainly willing to uh, look at our guidance and, and the evolution of what we may need to do from a, from a standpoint of within schools or businesses or elsewhere. But right now we, we don't have that information and we're waiting to, to see what the science has, has shows us so we can move forward. Governor, any closing remarks? Uh, no, I just uh, just to follow up what Dr. Shaw said, yes, we're going to continue to look at evolving science, but I do want to reiterate it's important to get our schools open today, and we, we've got to focus on getting that job done. These kids need to get back in the classroom. There's probably half of them in middle school and high school that are not back in the classroom. They desperately need that experience. And we are intensely focused in doing what's necessary to give these children that on-site experience now. So we're gonna remain focused on that. With that, again, I wanna thank everyone and please uh, be healthy and I hope you'll enjoy some good news today. We had uh, quite a bit of good news and hope people enjoy it. Take care.